take and read, chanted the child's voice from a neighboring house beyond the garden of the villa, in which a man was weeping in despair. His pursuit of wisdom and his quest for truth had led him steadily toward the Christian faith. But his unwillingness to let go of the licentious, immoral, and sinful lifestyle that he had enjoyed since his youth held him back. Take and read, came the child's voice again. This cannot be merely the words of a child's game, the man concluded but must be God's own voice to me. He hurried back to the place where he had left a copy of the scripture. He opened it, and the book fell opened, and he read the familiar words of the Apostle Paul. Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality, and debauchery, not in dissensions and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful flesh. From Romans chapter 13, verses 13 and 14. As he read the text, light he says, infused his heart and all the gloom and doubt that had lodged in him vanished as Augustine, the great theologian of the early church, believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and was born again. It is the word of God that provides the power It is the word of God that is embraced by faith and that brings about the change in a person's life. It brings new birth, it brings new life, it brings growth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, we see that Paul, in speaking to the church, says that he could not speak to them as spiritual people, because they lived like fleshly people in divisiveness, in rivalry, and in jealousy. Open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning at verse 1. The Apostle Paul says, says this, And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as to spiritual men or spiritual people, but as to people of the flesh even as infants in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians identifies four types of people. Four types of people in their spiritual composition. Uh, Last week we saw that he spoke about the natural person. The natural person who does not have the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, you are not a believer in Jesus Christ. When you trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Spirit of God comes to dwell within you, and the Spirit of God is the changing agent of God's divine essence in our hearts and lives. He introduces the spiritual person. The spiritual person who has matured by the Spirit of God. The spiritual person is one who over a period of time in cooperation with the divine work of the Holy Spirit in their lives and with the divine word of God has grown into a spiritual person. And he's going to tell us about the characteristics of a spiritual person. Now, it's uh, very possible, in fact, all too common that uh, people are believers in Jesus Christ for many, many, many years and never really become spiritually mature. The third person that he talks about is the fleshly person. The fleshly person who has not matured 
in the Spirit of God. The fleshly person is a person who is a believer in Jesus Christ. And although there are some theologians and some expositors who would try to say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian, um, you know, that's just uh, beyond the scope of Scripture and beyond the scope of, of uh, personal experience and life experience. But the Scriptures is what tells us that there are fleshly people. These are people who are believers in Jesus Christ, but have chosen not to cooperate with the Spirit of God, who have chosen constantly to compromise with the world, who have not developed the spiritual uh, disciplines so that they have matured in their spiritual lives. And then the, first, the fourth person that he mentions also briefly is the infant. The infant who needs time to mature in the Spirit of God. This is the new Christian. This is the new believer, the babe in Christ. And uh, these are people who are new in the faith and they need time to grow. And uh, that's the one thing about maturity is uh, there is no fast forward about maturity. There is no rushing the experience. You can't take an accelerated degree course in maturity. It is something that takes time, and we will talk about that time frame together. So the Apostle Paul has introduced to us in these chapters four different kinds of people, the natural person, the spiritual person, the fleshly person, and the infant. Which one are you? Which one am I? How do you know? Well, you know that uh, you are not one of the last three, but you must be the first one, the natural person, if you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you do not sense and know of the inner working of the Spirit of God in your mind or heart and conscience speaking to you, Uh, in life and speaking to you through the Word of God. The spiritual person is someone who has, uh, I would say, according to the timetable of Scripture, been an active believer for at least uh, three and a half to four years, who have uh, immersed themselves in the Word of God and uh, who have been maturing uh, by the work of the Spirit of God in their lives. Uh, The fleshly person is the person who has not matured in the Spirit of God, this is someone who, when confronted, for instance, with two options. Uh, Do I do this, which is clearly the will of God and a commitment to the Lord, or do I do this, which is a commitment to human institutions, community institutions, or to uh, things of the flesh that would fulfill uh, sinful desires of my life? When these two come in conflict, they will generally choose to... Uh, not do the will of God, but to do the things of the world or the things of the community. These are people who are not feeding upon the word of God, who are not yielding to the spirit of Christ. And then, of course, the infant, again, is somebody who's a new babe in Christ. Uh, Generally speaking, again, it's about a a four-year period of, uh, it appears, of spiritual growth to begin to think of oneself in terms of spiritual life. Some scriptures that uh, just uh, introduce us to the uh, spiritual person. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says that God has saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that takes us from a natural person to a believer in Jesus Christ whom God poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 says this, This is the only thing the Apostle Paul says I want to understand from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? speaking to people who are trying to work their way in their salvation or even work their way in their sanctification or growing in Christ. So very often people will get into legalism, rules, and uh, things like that. And, uh, and they, they think that they're going to grow by rules instead of by grace. 
He says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, that you are now going to be mature or perfected by the flesh? Also, very often, people get caught up in the, you know, the kinds of standards where they talk about, well, if I just do you know, this, then God is pleased with me. As long as I go to church on Sunday, I've done my obligation. As long as I say my occasional prayer, uh, then I have fulfilled my duty to God. And there's no commitment of the entire life. People have a tendency to go either to legalism or license and uh, not living according to the grace of God's word. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to God. How do you know whether you're truly a born-again believer? You sense the leading and the guiding of the spirit of God in your life. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, then you are religious, but you are not Christian. Romans chapter 8, verse 12, he says this, So then, brethren, we are no longer under obligation to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is a spiritual gut that one develops over life and in maturity that just uh, assures you in, in your inner being, the Spirit of God ministering in your life, that yes, you are a children of God. And if children, he says, we are heirs. And if we are heirs, we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. In this particular context, I don't think the suffering is the suffering of persecution. It's the suffering of spiritual growth. It's hard to grow in Jesus Christ. The lessons of maturity are difficult ones. The training is not easy. And we go through the suffering and the struggles of growing in Christ by the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts and in our lives. But Christians have to make decisions. And the decisions have to be that I'm putting the things of the flesh, the things of the world the things in conflict with God behind me, and I shall not compromise, but I shall grow. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says this, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, now you are not able. I thought about bringing a baby bottle up today and maybe a big steak. Uh, to suggest uh, which would you prefer to have. I mean, even if the baby bottle had chocolate milk in it, wouldn't we look silly? I guarantee you when we go to the Cracker Barrel today, I'm not going to order baby food. I'm not going to order a bottle of milk or something. I'd like to have some solid food. I don't want to grow anymore, though. But, you know, as believers in Jesus Christ, all too often and for all too long, we're sucking on milk. And that's all that we can receive. And the Apostle Paul is frustrated here. Now, it's been three and a half to four years since his introduction and his ministry with the Corinthians. And he says, you know, I'm giving you milk to drink because you're still not able to receive it. And yet, by now, you ought to be on solid food. It's interesting that Jesus spent three and a half or four years with his disciples and he expected them at that point to be mature enough to carry on their ministries. It's interesting, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews, but whoever wrote Hebrews writes to them after a period of uh, three to five years apparently and says to them, you know what, you ought to be mature by now. 
Uh, after we've been introduced to the faith and we've had a chance to grow, grow on the Word of God, we ought to be mature enough to not compromise, mature enough to make the right decisions, mature enough to be able to receive the solid food of the Word of God. It's a very strong, uh, what we call a sense of contrast here with the not yet, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, the strong contrast, even now you are not yet able. You should be, but you're not yet able. Uh, What is uh, milk according to the Bible? Well, in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, Uh, Paul says this, Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works. You know, one of the basic elementary teachings of the Bible is this. You accept God, you accept Jesus Christ by faith and not by works. And you live by faith and not by works. And you please God by faith and not by works. And that this is a life of grace in which we receive God's grace through his word and through the community of faith. And we understand more and more every year that we are saved by grace, maintained by grace, not by works. It is a faith relationship with God and of instructions about washings and the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. All of these basics we need to put behind us and we need to grow in Jesus Christ. Now, starting uh, not uh, uh, next week, but uh, early or towards the end of November, I'm going to have, during our Bible study time, a class for new believers in Jesus Christ or people who would like to get the foundations again. We've had the opportunity to see people coming to Christ at the church and outside the church and we want to build them up and we want them to understand the basics of the faith. And if you don't understand the basics, you're welcome to join us or you're welcome to get some literature, some good Bible study books, and grow. But now is the time to grow and to press on to maturity. We need to put aside the milk. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 says this, For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy, and probably better translated rivalry, and strife, and one of the earliest manuscripts also has the word dissensions among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men or mere people? If in your life there is jealousy or rivalry, if in the community of faith there is strife and dissensions, if you allow these kinds of uh, negative, no, no, sinful attitudes to reside in your heart. If you speak to others in such manners, the Apostle Paul says, you know, you're just living and acting like regular people, like the natural man, like the unsaved person, and you are still fleshly. In verse 4 he says, For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? When there is, and and I, I wonder, you know, how God looks down upon the individualism of humanity or the denominationalism of humanity. You know, what, what does he think about all of these different denominational groups and and they don't sometimes seem to fellowship together or to cooperate together. There is this this, uh, arrogant spirit of I or we are the only ones who are right. And that certainly should not be part of the Christian community. 
One says, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos. He says, you know, if that's the way you're thinking, if, if, if you have your little party groups, or if you have your little cliques, or, or your, your little theological you know, circles, and you exclude others, and you don't have dialogue with others, if it, if it creates a rivalry, or a strife, or even a dissension, then you're just acting like natural people, and you're not growing. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, If therefore anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, all things have come new. We ought to be growing in Christ. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we ought to be constantly putting behind us the things of the past and moving forward to the future. And as I said, there seems to be this time frame in the scriptures that certainly within three to five years, a person ought to, with commitment and, and uh, sincerity, be able to grow to maturity. In verse 5 he says, What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. Verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Individuals are not important. It is the community of faith. And the Corinthian church had got all divided up into little groups based upon their adherence to maybe whether Paul led them to Christ or Apollos led them to Christ or someone else did. And uh, instead of adhering and committing themselves to God through Jesus Christ. And so they had formed their little groups of following or their little groups of commitment. And Paul says, look, in the great scheme of things, there is only one spiritual causation, and that is God the Father. One has an opportunity to plant the seed. Another has the opportunity to water the seed. But ultimately, the seed grows because God causes the growth. And therefore, the one who waters and the one who plants, they aren't significant. What is significant is God causing the growth. What is important for us is that we do some seed planting, that we do some watering, that we be part of this great uh, agricultural, spiritual agricultural team that works to further the kingdom of God. Verse, chapter 1, verse 30 of 1 Corinthians says this, By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The, the more mature a believer comes in, Je in Jesus Christ, the more they understand this truth that God is the one who has chosen them. God is the one who is working on their life. God is the one who has been watching over them. Again, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18, Paul says this, Now all things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Apostle Paul wanting them to understand it doesn't matter who waters and who plants and who gets to you know, germinate the thing. Ultimately, it is God who causes the growth. And we need to be united in seeking to bring about that growth. Chapter 3, verse 8 of Corinthians. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. 
Yes, we are all part of one great cooperative effort seeking to uh, uh, expand the kingdom of God, seeking to share the gospel, seeking to bring people to faith. And uh, yes, although it is one great cooperative effort, God will reward us according to our individual work. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12 says this, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 6, verse 1, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Mark chapter 9, verse 41 For whoever gives a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Luke chapter 6, verse 35, But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what they have done. There is a sense, there is a proper and right spiritual motivation, I think, of serving the Lord to understand that we want to hear someday, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That we want to receive those rewards. Yes, maybe ultimately we will take those rewards and we will cast them at the feet of Christ and understand again that these would only have been accomplished if Christ had been at work in our, since Christ was at work in our life, that's the only way they were accomplished. But I do see a kind of spiritual motivation that is put forth in the scripture and that is serve the Lord your God that you might please him and that he might reward you. I'm so concerned about the investment of my life and my time. I remember uh, reading several great saints who said, I'm not afraid of failing. I'm afraid of succeeding at something that doesn't matter. I'm afraid of succeeding at something that has no eternal value. Recently talking to a businessman, and uh, he shared with me how uh, in his early 20s he went into business, and he's been so very successful, and, uh, you know, he's just, he's got 60 to 100 people working for him, even in the midst of the difficult economy. They are still doing so well. And... uh, His heart has just been concerned and burdened that all of it is for nothing in relationship to eternity. And although he feels blessed to have done all of this, he wants to turn his energies towards eternal values that he will not find out that he has succeeded at nothing. 1 Corinthians 3.9, Paul says this, For we are God's fellow workers. We're working right along with God. For you, he says, are God's field. You are God's building. Two imageries. One of a, uh, of a field in which uh, seed is planted and the uh, skies water it and it grows. Uh, some of you are, are into gardening. Some of you are into Flowers. Uh, that's a great uh, kind of recreation, relaxation kind of thing to do. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to plant something and watch it grow, isn't it? It's a, it's a wonderful thing to have it grow and then be able to go out and pick it off the vine or off the tree or whatever and uh, to enjoy it and to consume it. It's a wonderful thing to build something. Uh, I've had the opportunity... Uh, to build uh, three houses uh, in uh, my time. Uh, Each one of them, a tremendous amount of labor, but a tremendous amount of satisfaction. In fact, there was was just something very special about walking into that home, knowing every 
nook and cranny and two by four and nail and electrical outlet and the satisfaction of, uh, of, of accomplishing that. But you know what? They're all going to pass away. They're all going to be left in eternity. And although they might be worthy goals on earth, they, I also need to have some worthy goals in eternity. And I need to have a, a neighborhood that I see as a field. I need to have a community that I see as a building. And that I'm growing and I'm building things for eternity. Paul says, you are God's field. You are God's building. Let's grow. Let's expand. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 says this, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. 1 Peter 2, 5, You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ or through Christ Jesus. Yes, uh, we are a field. We are a building. And we are to be growing. We are to be expanding. And we do that by getting involved in the lives of our neighbors, our co-workers, people round about us so that we can share with them the gospel, so that we can plant the spiritual thought, so that we can water some seed, and so that we can pray and see God cause the growth. Paul was very frustrated with the people at Corinth. He, uh, he couldn't get them united. They wouldn't bring themselves together because there was this individualism. There was this uh, rivalry or jealousy. There was this uh, kind of a fleshly lifestyle. They had not committed themselves to the uncompromising obedience to the Spirit of Christ through the Word of God. We must grow in Christ so that we can share Christ and be a vital part of God's harvesting and God's building process. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 5 so that we can see a little bit about how this happens. How do you grow in Christ? How do you grow and mature spiritually? Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 says, Concerning him, concerning Christ and the Melchizedekian priesthood, he says, We have much more to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, and that is our goal, we ought to grow in Christ to the point that we have the opportunity to teach others, whether it's a Bible study at work or Bible study in the community or Bible study with a new believer, certainly with our family. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. Verse 14. But solid food is for the mature, who, because of practice have trained, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. How does this work? It works by diligently, properly feeding on the solid food of the Word of God. And as you understand the Word of God and sound theology and the teachings of it, then by practice... By practice of taking the Word of God 
and applying it to your life, you develop a spiritual maturity, a spiritual discernment that helps you to understand what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong, what are the proper decisions of life. It is the Word of God that effectually works in us who believe. Chances are, if you haven't grown spiritually and matured in your life, it's because you haven't been feeding on the Word of God. And beloved, this is not the trough. This is but a little tidbit. You must go each and every day to the Word of God. This is an opportunity to hear And this is part of it all, but this is not it. This is not enough. And we need to be involved in our own personal Bible study, our own exposure to the Word of God by the Spirit of God so that the solid food helps us to mature because we we form this habit, we form this training in which we say to ourselves, not just what would Jesus do, But what does the word of God tell me to do?